Order members, question time has resumed and it's now time for questions to the Minister of Health. And I uh, call Martina Anderson. All good. Catch to Verheyen, question number one. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the member for her question. Um, my department continues to take forward our test, trace and protect strategy, which is actually published on the 27th of May. It adopts a robust public health approach to minimising COVID-19 transmission in the community in Northern Ireland. It contains four key elements to test, trace and protect, which are early in identification and isolation of possible cases, clusters and outbreaks, rapid testing of possible cases, tracing of close contacts of cases, and the early effect of unsupported isolation of close contacts to prevent onward transmission of infection. Test, trace and protect is being led by the Public Health Agency in conjunction with other key partners in Northern Ireland. The health protection team at the health Public Health Agency has specialist skills and experience of communicable disease control. The development and implementation of our contact tracing service has been a priority for me over recent months. Test, trace and protect has a vital role to play in helping us move forward into recovery. This along with other key public health measures such as the maintenance of physical distancing and ensuring good hand and respiratory hygiene will help us to minimise community transmission of COVID-19. For test, trace and protect to work, each citizen in Northern Ireland has a very important role to play. We must all prepare for the possibility of having to self-isolate and prepare to be tested in order to protect ourselves, our families and our communities. I recognise that in some cases there may be financial dis disincentives to self-isolation and further work is required to address those barriers. The approach I have outlined is likely to become part of everyday life for the foreseeable future for the people of Northern Ireland until an effective vaccine is developed and a vaccination programme for COVID-19 has been delivered. I call Martina Anderson for supplementary. The, the Minister for his answer. And Minister, given the mass resignation of RQIA because that care homes inspections were arbitrarily reduced and um, by you or your department. Uh, Minister, do you accept that this feeds into a genuine concern that care homes were abandoned and the most vulnerable and elderly um, were left exposed to this deadly virus and had we had the tracking and tracing system in place that we might be in a different place where unfortunately we are today? I thank the, the member for, for her follow-up question. I think there's two points there. Uh, in regards to the support that we gave to, to care homes. And I think we have uh, been proactive in the approach that we have given to our care homes, and that has been reciprocated and acknowledged by care home providers across the piece. Are there things we could do differently now, looking in hindsight into how those supports were implemented and the speeds they implemented because of what we know now, because of the virus and how it interacts? I think we would do things very different. In regards to the test, trace and track, it's not, it's not a system that is highly advantageous in the care home sector because they are closed, isolated units. So th there's a piece of work that can be done in supporting, especially the staff that are working in the care homes in regards should there be, should there be an outbreak or, or a continuation of infection coming from a care home into a staff member's care home or even staff working across care homes, which what we, we had identified so in the past. So it's about learning from, from what we know now compared to what we knew three, four months ago when we were working without a guide or a rule book as to how we actually combated COVID-19 in, in, in the general population, but in care homes specifically. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Question to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for the question. On the 30th of June 2020, my department published updated guidance, which applies from the 6th of July in all health and social care settings for the duration of the COVID-19 response. This revised guidance sets out the current position in respect of pregnant women in that so long as the surge level, uh, level in the Northern Ireland Executive five-step approach permits aligned to the pandemic surge levels, the R value, and based on the best scientific advice available at any given time. Birth partners will be facilitated to accompany the pregnant woman to a dating scan, early pregnancy clinic, anomaly scan, and fetal medicine, medicine department uh, for induction of labour, for the duration of labour on birth, and to visit in an antenatal and postnatal wards as appropriate. The full guidance is available online at my department's website, uh, healthni.gov.uk, COVID visiting guidance. Call David Hildage. Thank you, Deputy 
Please, Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister uh, for his answer and all the work that he's been doing to date in, in the situation that we find ourselves. Uh, constituents were, were basically seeking some clarification on the 34 week scan where they thought that that wasn't included in, in the new guidelines, but maybe the Minister wants to take that away and find the answer to that. But. Sure, I'm prepared, prepared to look at that. Uh, within the guidance itself, um, and in regards to the definition and scope, the guidance outlines the situations where the woman can be accompanied by her partner and nominated other. Uh, and the revised guidance is applicable to women, as I've said, for the 12-week pregnancy dating scan, the early pregnancy clinic, the anomaly scan, the attendance of fetal medicine department, and the duration of, of labour and birth. Um, but there are, under the key principles, there may be occasions and in individual trusts uh, that visiting for specific, for specific reasons may be limited rather than outlined in, than is actually in this guidance. And this will mo most likely be to reduce the number of people in the, any one area to comply with social distancing rules. But in that scenario, clear explanations will be given to the women and their partner or nominated other. But in regards to the 34 week scan, I'll take that away and look at it for the member. We are going to call Harry Harvey. Lady Speaker, question three. Again, um, I thank the member for his question. The eligibility for the flu vaccine programme will not be adversely impacted by any of the COVID-19 restrictions. Indeed, I am extending eligibility this year to include all children in year eight of secondary schools. However, delivery of the programme may need to be adapted to accommodate any restrictions that apply at the time. Discussions are ongoing between my department, the public health agency, trusts, general practice, the Department of Education and the Education Authority to ensure the programme is fully delivered while abiding by COVID-19 restrictions. This year, the flu vaccination programme will be more important than ever in order to try and reduce the risk of concurrent circulation of influenza and COVID-19, because early evidence suggests that co-infection is associated with increased mortality of over twofold compared to those with COVID-19 alone. So it is important we do all we can to help reduce flu-related pressures on the health service. And I would encourage all those who are eligible to receive the flu vaccine to take up the offer and vaccination when invited to do so. I call Harry Harvey for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Could the Minister tell me if sufficient vaccinations are available for the 2021 period? And will the programme start on time? Thank you. Again, I thank the member for his supplementary, and I can give him the assurance that a sufficient vaccine has been ordered to ensure that those eligible for vaccination will receive it based on uptake rates in the year 2020. However, I expect greater demand for the flu vaccine this year, and I am keen to increase the uptake rates. To that end, I have approved the purchase of additional vaccine for children, and I am considering purchasing additional vaccine for those aged 65 and over, given that my department has already been informed that additional supplies for this age group may be available. At present, we are trying to establish how much additional vaccine is available and how best it could be used should we decide to purchase it. For the 2021 flu programme, the Public Health Agency have already procured uh, the following vaccine doses, 260,000 doses for use of those aged 65 and over. 2,605,000 doses for use in the under 65s in any at risk group, 198,000 doses of the nasal spray vaccine for children, 10,000 doses of an injectable vaccine for those children who cannot receive the nasal spray for medical uh, reasons. So, over 800,000 flu vaccines have already been ordered for use this winter in Northern Ireland. Um, based on previous uptake rates, this should be more than sufficient. But given the need to try and maximise uptake rates and reduce the impact of flu on the health service, we are currently considering if more is still required. The flu programme is complicated and that different types of vaccine are recommended and licensed for different age groups, and therefore it isn't simply a matter of buying any flu vaccine. Ideally, we want to ensure we purchase the best vaccine for any particular age group, and I would encourage anyone who is eligible to take up the flu vaccine to make sure that we can start on schedule and complete it in time for the winter flu season. I call Jim Allister. Question four. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic created a challenge for primary care that is without parallel in our lifetimes. The establishment of primary care COVID-19 centres was an urgent and immediate response to these challenges. 
ensuring that primary care services could be maintained throughout the first wave of infections by enabling patients who had COVID-19 systems to be treated separately from those patients who have other conditions which require assessment or treatment in primary care. The speed at which centres were established was exceptional and a testament to the commitment, professionalism and skill of all involved in their establishment. And I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to colleagues across the service for that work. A regional project board was established to oversee the development and operation of COVID centres. This is chaired by the Health and Social Care Board and includes representation from the GP federations, the out of hours providers, the Royal College of GPs and the British Medical Association. I make that point to emphasise that the work in this area has been done with GPs and not to GPs, as some would suggest. The Regional Project Board has been continually reviewing the number, location and staffing of COVID-19 centres. Staffing levels for the centres are currently around 50% of those at the peak of the surge. As the number of cases continue to reduce, work is currently underway to review and, if appropriate, rationalise this service while retaining a capacity for re-escalation if necessary. The Project Board is also working with colleagues in the PHA to consider whether it is possible to put in place measures that can enable COVID-19 centres to be delivered from GP practices. But we need to be very clear that we cannot take risks with people's safety, and this would not be considered a simplistic opportunity to scale back COVID-19 centres as an opportunity to save money. They are an innovation designed to save lives, and staffing has been safely reduced in response to current demand. While the current wave of infections appears to be subsiding, health and social care services need to remain vigilant and be prepared to respond rapidly to further surges should a new wave arise during the winter flu season. We need to be prepared, and closing down COVID centres prematurely would significantly undermine this. Whatever their use at the peak of the pandemic, and even that I don't think was huge, they are characterised at the moment by gross underuse. I have GPs telling me of doing four-hour shifts and seeing no patient, and yet they are paid out of hours £100 an hour, and there is a support staff to be paid as well. Where is the medical and financial sense now in continuing with that? And would the Minister care to comment? One GP reported to me that a representative of the BMA said to those GPs that the centres were being kept open purely for political reasons. Is there any truth in that? There is absolutely no truth in that last statement, and I can assure the, the, the member of that. There is no political advantage for me in keeping COVID-19 centres open. What there is is a significant health supplement as to the, the people that we have been supporting through them, and as we still manage a health service that needs to be able to react flexibly should there be another upsurge in COVID uh, patients or an outbreak. To date, or up until the 17th of June, 7,526 people had been seen through the COVID centres. And he does refer to a number of centres where a number of shifts where no patients were seen. Uh, that, that is correct, and we're fortunate to be in that position in a number of areas. And I can give the member the detail. Um, there was nine days in the Swall where we saw no patient, three in Dungannon, five in Lisburn, nine in Down, one in Newton Ards, and three in Coleraine. Now, that's over a period from the 9th of April to the 17th of June. And as I said in the initial answer to the member, that is why we are scaling back the service of the GPs and their attendance and the contract uh, that they're actually uh, asked to be in those centres and to be available. Because while we have COVID-19 in retreat, we have not defeated it yet. And I would be negligent in my duty if we didn't make sure that we had the ability to respond should there be another outbreak in certain areas where these COVID-19 centres have proved to be beneficial and have been supported by the BMA, the Royal College of GPs and also the federations as well. Moving on, I call Andy Allen. Again, I thank the member for his question. Uh, contact tracing is a uh, central tenant of the test, test, trace and protect strategy that I launched on the 27th of May 2020. It is an established method of identifying and breaking chains of infection and clusters of communicable disease. 
While the Public Health Agency and our colleagues in environmental health are well versed in the youth use of such an approach, there is clear difference in the operation required to help the management of COVID-19 in terms of both the scale of the pandemic and the fact that this is an unknown disease. Contact tracing works by testing people potentially infected with the disease, speaking to them to advise on isolation, identifying their close contacts who may be at risk of contracting the disease, and then speaking to these contacts to give guidance on isolation and what to do if symptoms develop. Contact tracing in itself will not eradicate COVID-19. It can only work as part of an overall strategy of testing and adherence and support for the advice to isolate as well as maintaining measures such as hand hygiene and the appropriate social distancing. On the 27th of April, the PHA began a pilot to test its capacity to respond at scale to the requirements for contact tracing during this pandemic. This involved tracing the contacts of a sample of cases who had tested positive. On the 18th of May, the agency began the transition to a programme of tracing contacts of all the positive cases, and on the 25th of May, this transition was completed. Northern Ireland was the first part of the United Kingdom to have this service operational. My department is overseeing the scaling of the operation, which is likely to be required for the next two years until a vaccine is available and the mass vaccination programme is in place. The service itself operates at a number of levels. It has a manual contact tracing centre where skilled clinical contact tracers will call all positive cases and their contacts to advise and guide the next steps. A cohort of public health consultants who provide medical advice and clinical leadership to the centre, as well as deal with complex cases and manage outbreaks or clusters of diseases. Other staff will be recruited to support the analysis of the information and intelligence gathered in order to advise on the progression and management of the disease, along with administrative and managerial support for the centre. A call centre will provide Northern Ireland centric advice on various aspects of checking symptoms, booking tests, and providing signposts to sources of social and community support. There will be a suite of digital products that will support the process of those citizens who have the means and preference to work that way. I can update the member in the period from the 25th of May to the 24th of June. There have been 481 cases added to the contract tracing database, and successful telephone encounters with the cases have resulted in 82% contacts, with 733 contacts identified. I'm, I'm conscious, Mr. There's a lot of important information there. Answers should take two minutes, and you can request an additional minute should you require it. I call Andy Allen for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for, for his uh, comprehensive answer? Uh, Minister, you've outlined that contact tracing is one important resource at the disposal of your department, alongside various others. Uh, indeed, the, executive, uh, the wider executive guidance and regulations. Um, and recently, we've seen examples of mass gatherings, which uh, are perceived to have succeeded that as set out. Um, can the Minister perhaps outline if he's confident that contact tracing would have the resources at their disposal should an outbreak occur as a result of one of those mass gatherings? Um, I thank the member for his supplementary. Currently, when I was indicating how many contact tracers we had in place, we have 92 who work over a seven-day week uh, rotation. And of course, the more, the more contacts, the more positive cases we have, the more pressure they become they actually become under. So it's, it's, it's average that each contact tracer can, can trace um, five uh, contacts in a day. So, of course, any mass gathering which breaches uh, the guidance or the regulations where we can have a, a potential for identified um, mm -hmm. mass outbreaks does put that contact tracing system uh, under pressure. So I would ask everyone uh, to follow the advice, the guidance and the regulations that are clearly laid out and supported by the executive in preventing um, any further contact or spread of COVID-19, which could further, further put our contact tracing system under, under pressure. Moving on, I call Keith Buchanan. Thanks, please. Um, again, I, I thank the member for his question. While the timing and scale are clearly unpredictable, it is expected that there will be a second wave of COVID-19 later in the year. This will depend on a range of factors, including the executive future approach to minimising the spread of the virus and the public's adherence to these measures. While plans for the initial surge were carried out at a time when there was limited data available, there has been much learning drawn from the first wave and work by my department 
has made it possible to track and monitor the trajectory of the pandemic much more effectively. I will be monitoring closely the reproductive rate of infection and other key metrics and will provide regular advice to the Executive to ensure we seek to introduce the right measures at the right time. I have asked my officials to develop comprehensive surge plans for critical care, hospital beds and care homes for future waves of COVID-19. With these plans taking account of the potential for the next surge to coincide with colder weather and the usual winter pressures, this work includes exploring if the development of a further Nightingale facility will be necessary to help lift pressures from the system. The Belfast City Hospital tower block was designated Northern Ireland's Nightingale for the first wave and will maintain additional ICU capacity for future phases. However, we know that additional pressures may also be needed to be lifted from the system and are considering this carefully. For supplementary. Thank you and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Obviously, with, with any risk, probability and likelihood is a multiplication to give you that risk rating. With the actions of others this past week or two, has that increased the likelihood of this happening? And I hope those people involved that will have some, something on their conscience if that does the, is the case. What I have said um, for the past number of months, our biggest uh, risk now is that of complacency and the, the disregard of the rules and regulations um, and the recommendations that have been laid down by the entirety of the executive. By following that joint, um, lead, that joint messaging that we had, we were able to get Northern Ireland into a very good place uh, in regards to the infection and the spread of COVID-19. And I am concerned that any blatant outbreach or, or out, outworkings of not following those rules and regulations will have an impact on the spread of COVID-19. So all I can say and ask is that the people of Northern Ireland follow the guidance and the regulations that are laid down and supported by the entirety uh, of the Northern Ireland Executive to maintain the place that we have in managing the spread of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland. I call Catherine Kelly. Shocked. Question seven. Um, thank the member for her question. Um, on the 18th of June, I appointed Christine Collins as interim non-executive chair of the RQIA board. This interim appointed, uh, appointment is intended to start the process of reconstructing the RQIA's board in order to ensure that it can continue to exercise effective oversight of the RQIA's work and statutory responsibilities. I fully recognise the need for permanent appointments to be made to the RQIA board as soon as it is possible to do so. I have instructed my officials to immediately put in place arrangements to initiate a public appointments competition, which will seek to appoint a permanent non-executive chair and 10 permanent non-executive members. My department values and promotes diversity and is committed to equal equality of opportunity for all with appointments made on merit. In keeping with my department's commitment to co-production and partnership working, I am keen to ensure that the permanent appointments made to the RQIA board will further strengthen the voice of people who use the services in the field of regulation, quality and improvement. To attract as much interest as possible, the RQI board vacancies will be widely publicised. The Department's plan communications for this competition will seek to encourage all individuals who wish to participate in public service and make a difference to the way in which health and social care services are delivered in Northern Ireland, and I encourage them to submit an application form. This forthcoming public appointments competition will comply fully with the provisions outlined in the Commissioner's Code of Practice for Ministerial Appointments in Northern Ireland. It can take approximately nine months for a department to administer a public appointments competition in line with the provisions set out in the Code of Practice. Therefore, in view of this time scale and until such times as it is possible to make the permanent appointments, I am proceeding to urgently appoint a number of interim non-executive members. These interim non-executive member appointments are considered necessary to ensure the RQI's board is court without further delay. Given the unprecedented situation in RQIA, these interim non-executive member appointments will be made under the emergency procedure in line with the Commissioner's Code of Practice. My officials are currently developing a plan which will set out a proportionate recruitment process to secure these interim appointments to the RQIA board. My officials will engage with the Commissioner to obtain her approval of the content of this recruitment plan prior to its implementation. Call Catherine Kelly for supplementary. Call my Ogutles, Ken Corley, Minister, thank you for your answer. How do you intend to broaden out the recruitment process to ensure a representative, inclusive and diverse RQA board membership? Um, and, and I thank the, the member for her, for her question. I, I touched on it there towards the, 
the end of my initial response, but I think that is important. Um, I think the RQIA board does have to have representation that can speak on behalf of those service users, so has experience of the care home um, sector as well as, as all the other sectors that it does. Um, quality improve or quality inspect, but also for uh, the insurance point of view as well, as well as, as, as progression um, and the delivery of service to make sure that those facilities are delivering um, for the people who actually use them and the residents within them. So in regards to uh, the initial process and point in the, the interim non-executive members, I will be doing that under the Commissioner's Code of Practice. But as I said earlier, in regards to the public advertisements, I would encourage as many people as possible who have an interest in improving the quality on the inspection side of our care home sector and all the other sectors that our QIA inspect and regulate to, to please apply for the full-time post that will be, will be advertised. And I call him Becklin McLear. Grimalgat, Kesh, I would have to question it. Again, I thank the member for, for his question. My approach to rebuilding has been informed by engagement with trade unions at the development stage of rebuilding HSC services strategic framework. My officials sought views from a range of stakeholders, which included trade unions, trade unions on the checklist, which outlines the key factors which should be considered in the development of service rebuilding plans. I have also sought the view of trade unions on the temporary amendments to the HSC framework, which provides basis for the role of the rebuilding HSC services management board. I am currently giving consideration to these views, which will inform my approach to public consultation going forward. I can confirm that this will be a 12-week consultation, providing ample opportunity for trade unions and other stakeholders to respond. In addition, my officials meet regularly with trade unions, providing an opportunity for ongoing engagement. Furthermore, on the 1st of July, I chaired a, a very useful meeting of the Strategic Health and Social Care Partnership Forum. This group brings together senior executives across the system with trade union colleagues. In terms of the Transformation Advisory Board, this group was originally established to advise on the transformation programme. But clearly, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, work on that front has been limited in recent months mm -hmm. and has not been, able, been possible for the Transformation Advisory Board to meet on a formal basis, with meet, meetings which were scheduled on the 7th of April and 1st of June having to be postponed. The future role of the Transformation Advisory Board will be kept under view in the context of the governance changes, and I plan to consult on this later in the summer, but I have directed my officials to have a meeting of the Transformation Advisory Board as currently stands as soon as possible. And I am confident that through a forthcoming period of consultation on temporary amendments to the HSE framework and local engagement in the development and implementation of rebuilding plans, that there are sufficient mechanisms to support meaningful and constructive engagement in the rebuilding programme. Call Declan McAleer. Graham I thank the Minister for his response. Could the Minister give any sort of indicative timescale as for the reopening of the public consultation that you referred to? We are, we are working on that at this minute in time in regards to what that will actually look like over the 12-week period because it was the 12-week consultation on the establishment of the, the management board. As we, and then further to that is the, I suppose, the step process of the rebuilding structure. But we've already completed one for, for the month of June. We're now looking at the plans for the next three months for July, August and September, and then there'll be a further three months after that. So as soon as we have the detail of what that consultation will look like, it will be published and be made available. Moving on, I call Gordon Dunn. Question 9, Mr Deputy Speaker. The member will be aware that on the 9th of June 2020, I published a strategic framework for rebuilding health and social care services, along with phase one rebuilding plans for each of the six health and social care trusts. These aim to incrementally increase HSC service capacity as quickly as possible across all programmes of care, including outpatient clinics within the prevailing COVID-19 conditions. Subsequent phases will see these services active activity plans and targets updated in three monthly cycles. Phase two, July to, to, July to September rebuilding plans will be published shortly. It is important to emphasise that as trusts work to deliver services for those most in need, the priority remains to keep patients, service users and staff safe, all of which requires careful balancing of safety requirements, including the maintenance of social distancing guidelines, and the impact this has on physical space, workforce availability and PPE availability. Throughout the pandemic, Belfast City Hospital continued to deliver vital outpatient services and the Trust 
has indicated that these will continue on the basis of clinical priority through telephone and video calls and only where required with face-to-face -face attendance at other Belfast Trust sites. Plans are in place to open Belfast City Hospital for outpatients in the phased approach. The priority clinics expected to return in the first instance are dermatology, gynaecology, ENT, breast and mammography. It is critically important to emphasise that it will not be possible, nor indeed desirable, to return to business as usual. We must seek to improve services through the build, three building process, but this will not happen overnight and will require a response that is both agile and adaptable to ensure the system can respond to further potential COVID-19 surges. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer and indeed all his efforts in the COVID crisis. Early June, you, uh, Minister, you highlighted that outpatient activity had dropped 40 to 50 per cent. Can you give us an assurance today that the red flag cancer referrals at the City Hospital and indeed other services, including dermatology, will be fully restored right across all, all of our trusts? I thank the member for his question and on for his supportive comments. Uh, the Belfast Trust recently submitted its Stage 2 rebuilding plan for July, August and September, which has involved enhanced local system working, strong clinical leadership, flexible and remote working where appropriate, and rapid scaling of technology enabled service delivery. The Trust engaged with frontline staff to reflect on lessons learned and further work on, its crucial, on, on this is crucial to inform plans. The Phase 2 plan will be published by the Department on Health and due course. And as I said, the priority clinics returning will be dermatology, gynaecology, ENT, throat, and breast and mammography, which is scheduled to return on the 20th of July. The ongoing plan is that Belfast City Hospital outpatients will open in a phased approach from week beginning the 14th of July onwards. And red flag and urgent cases are being prioritised because the Trust is working on relocating administrative and medical staff who were placed in Belfast City Hospital outpatient department in order to maintain services and social distance as a result of the Nightingale services. Thank you. I now call Sinead Innes. Thank you. Question 10. Um, the principles of partnership working and crew production are the heart of the ongoing review of urgent and emergency care and remain so as we emerge from the first wave of COVID-19 to contemplate the long-term model that can best meet the needs of all citizens. The challenge in facing our urgent and emergency care services are complex and the root causes are system-wide. Whilst these issues often manifest in the form of busy emergency departments and long delays in admitting patients to hospital, the solutions require a coordinated approach across all of health and social care one which is led by clinicians and informed by the experiences of those who use these services, their families and their carers. That is why my de department initiated a clinical-led review of urgent and emergency care in November 2018, with a remit to examine all of the areas which are crucial to the coordinated delivery of unscheduled care, including the care of older people, children, those requiring better and better access to mental health services, the role of the ambulance service, and better coordination across primary, secondary and community care pathways to ensure that people get the right care in the right place as soon as they need it. Service users and carers have had an important role in shaping the review to date through a crew production work stream which has undertaken research, designed surveys and made valuable recommendations to improve patient pathways and experiences. The work of the review was at an advanced stage prior to the outbreak of COVID-19 and I intend to complete this work and publish the review report later this summer. In the context of the ongoing pandemic, there may also be some immediate, immediate actions which we require to ensure that our EDs and hospitals do not reach the levels of overcrowding <coughs> that we have seen in previous years. In the meantime, I can assure the member that the partnership and co-production approach has been at the core of what has been a transparent and inclusive review to date and will continue to play a central role as we move forward. Minister, for his response, um, I'd like to ask the Minister, is he aware that over the course of the weekend just past, the entire South Down, Newry and South Armagh area were without any ambulance cover whatsoever? Um, I'd like to ask the Minister, what does he have to say to my constituents who are rightly aggrieved by this, and will you urgently address this issue? 
Um, I, I thank the member um, for her supplementary, and it, it was something was brought to my attention. I think it was her party colleague uh, highlighted it during the in the media, and the Northern Ireland Ombuds Service has issued issued a statement on that. The normal, which they say, the normal level of cover in Newry Station for Saturday day shifts is usually two crews. However, on this occasion, the Northern Ireland Ombuds Service has arranged had arranged an additional crew. And the plan cover was actually enhanced by 50% with three crews on duty. At the time of the call, which was highlighted in the media, all three crews were engaged on other emergency calls, and the nearest available emergency ambulance crew was dispatched to the call, um, which arrived at 17:45. They, they did apologise for the delay in responding to the call, but, but they do want to also point out that no matter what was recorded on social media in regards to nearly an hour, it was actually 28 minutes. I would say that our, the, the NIE ambulance staff are highly committed healthcare professionals who always give of their best, and it's demoralising for them to see negative reports relating to response times and misleading references and inferences about patient conditions on social media. And we would respectfully ask that anyone, but particularly public representatives, should actually contact the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service in the first instance to ascertain the accuracy of response times while being mindful of maintaining patient confidentiality. Um, they will be happy to engage in a manner which benefits patients and improves our services to local communities. Northern Ireland Ambulance Service is very grateful to those staff on the front line and in ambulance control who continue to work tirelessly to ensure that an ambulance response is provided to those who have an immediate and life-threatening need. So I would place on record my full support for the Northern Ireland Ambulance Services. We are working on their challenging and critical times, and I would ask the members to be supportive of them rather than critical of them. And I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Number 11. Um, there are no current plans to implement mobile vans in rural communities to support wellbeing. The focus has been on online provision to ensure equitable provision for all. The current support in place to support mental wellbeing is isolated rural communities is the COVID wellbeing Northern Ireland online hub. Psychological first aid for all those working or volunteering with local communities. Health and social care organisations have part partnered with the organisation for the review of care and health apps to create a library of health and wellbeing apps for everyone that has been reviewed and rated as helpful, safe and secure. Helplines Northern Ireland is available to rural communities. The stress control programme that would normally be delivered by the five health and social care trusts has been adapted to be delivered online since COVID, and rural support are commissioned by the Public Health Agency to support rural communities. Nicole Carhunter. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, given the complexity of COVID-19 and rural barriers to access, do you have any specific strategies for tackling uh, elderly loneliness specifically? Thank you. Um, and, and I thank the member for, for her supplementary. Um, in regards to older people specifically, there, there's nothing that I'm aware of, but having worked with uh, the community pharmacy, and spoke to them in regards to their delivery services. They were saying, you know, when they were out delivering medicines, what they were finding was that engagement with the, the older people who had been self-isolating and shielding was, was of, of vital importance. So there is a, there is a piece of work, and I think we've been working uh, with our community and voluntary sectors in supporting uh, the older people um, who have been self-isolating and shielding at this time. There have been a number of projects, and one I, I think that is worth. Uh, mentioning especially in rural areas is that uh, of rural support because what we have saw is the rural support helpline um, has increased and the cost to it has increased as a result of COVID-19. Um, however, the ability to deliver one-to-one face-to-face mentoring is, is limited due to social distancing measures. Um, so pre preparations are ongoing for the recruitment of additional mentors, um, even through rural support, who will be needed post-COVID-19. Uh, due to increased demands for, for services. And I call Sinead McLaughlin. Question 12, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the member for our questions. The interests of all health and social care colleagues are represented through the current membership of the Management Board. 
And in taking forward their ambitious work programme, the Management Board will take account of and represent all relevant expert advice. Regarding allied health profession representation, the Chief Nursing Officer represents the views of nurses, midwives and the allied health professionals on the Management Board and will be advised by the Chief Allied Health Professional Officer in my department. In addition, the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer will attend meetings of the Management Board as necessary. My approach to rebuilding has been informed by ongoing engagement with trade unions, both in relation to the development of the checklist to be considered in the development of service rebuilding plans and on the temporary changes to the HSC framework. My officials also meet regularly with the trade unions and I chaired a very useful meeting of the Strategic Health and Social Care Partnership Forum on the 1st of July. In terms of engagement with frontline workers, the checklist outlined in the rebuilding strategic framework clearly states that service providers must ensure that there is a consistent approach to the meaningful involvement of staff in developing solutions and in decisions which affect their working life. I expect the Rebuilding Management Board to monitor this closely as plans are developed and to advise me accordingly. Call Sinead McLaughlin for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for, for your answer. Would the Minister agree that one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us that working together um, has better outcomes and the more expertise and integration and cooperation and cross-departmental working has better outcomes for our patients and for our management. Uh, and if, he, if this is true, then surely that the management board must reflect that. And I would ask him to give greater consideration for more expertise on that management board, particularly across the, the uh, allied health uh, experts. I, I thank the member for her support and also the acknowledgement that the board is made up of, of high, highly skilled professionals and and not the cabal that it was referred to, to recently uh, in the Health Committee. In regards to, to representation on the Management Board, as I said in my earlier answer, the, um, the Chief Allied Health Professional works through the Chief Nursing Officer on that structure. That is, that is the line of reporting. Um, the Chief Dental Officer reports through the Chief Medical Officer. So there is, they are represented on the Management Board, and when their input and expert advice is needed and required, they can attend the Board. So it's not the fact that they they are excluded from it. It's not the permanent members of it. So there are there are avenues where their expert advice can be sought and engaged. And I call Gary Middleton. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. As you be aware, on the 9th of June, the Western Trust published its plan for the month of June, along with the rebuilding strategic framework that I announced on the same day. Along with other trusts, the Western Trust will shortly publish its rebuilding plan for the period of July to September, setting out planned activity for the next three months. The Management Board will monitor progress on the implementation of this plan, which will be monitored. I call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for that? Um, the Minister will be aware that the Western Trust today has again issued guidance around Elton and Gavin Hospital and the emergency department, uh, an increase in numbers. At one point, there were up to 60 in the emergency department. Uh, what advice can the Minister give to people coming to emergency departments? And can he give an update as to when GP surgeries will reopen to take the pressure off emergency departments? The, the advice that we had given was, was actually covered in the the guidance as I'm visiting, where we ask people who are attending an emergency department to attend on their own if possible, but if they do need support by, by another duty, either medical um, or support needs, that they should attend, you know, they should bring somebody with them. But and if they could, it would be preferable that they did attend on their own just to reduce the numbers that were actually coming in to the emergency departments. And I think it follows into an answer to an earlier question in regards to the ongoing review of emergency and urgent care services that we do need to complete um, across Northern Ireland because we do need to look seriously about how we manage how people approach our emergency departments and where else they can actually go to seek medical assistance and advice. So the member's point in regards to GP services and surgeries, um, opening up for, for more face-to-face -face engagement is something that we're working in regards with the GP federations with so we can move to that normalisation. But there are changes that have been made over the past 14 to 15 weeks in regards to telephone three eyes and telephone consultations that GPs have had to introduce that have been beneficial 
Um, but what I would always say, if anybody does need to see a medical professional face to face, that that avenue and opportunity is always there for them. And that is the end of our questions to the Minister for Health. And I've asked members to take their ease for a few moments. Point of order. Just a point of order, I'll be speaking in relation to all our languages used within the chamber. As we've seen in the previous uh, question time, all our languages we use that weren't English, and it leaves some ministers and some members not understanding what the, other, the answers actually are. So it would pass a review.